This is Open Book, a podcast about interpreting literature, with Michael Elliott. Welcome to Open Book, episode 15, How to Read Jane Austen's Northanger Abbey, volume 1. I'm Michael Elliott, Associate Professor of English at the University of Calgary, and today's is the first of three episodes on Jane Austen's 1818 novel, Northanger Abbey, the story of 17-year-old Catherine Morland's coming of age and romantic misadventures, first in the spa city of Bath, and then in volume two at the titular estate of the wealthy Tilney family, whose second son, Henry Tilney, ultimately asks Catherine to marry him. Northanger Abbey is a novel about relationships, about relationships between characters in Bath society, and about relationships between this novel and other novels. Those are the two main sections of today's episode, so we'll address each of them in turn. Let's start with how it is that you read Jane Austen for the first time. We are using David M. Shapard's 2013 annotated edition, which prints the text of the novel on alternating pages with extended facing page annotations and a wealth of contemporary illustrations. The first time reader of Northanger Abbey would be very well served, by the way, by reading through Shepard's chronology of events in the novel on pages 5, 11 to 14, which lays out all of the events in the 11 weeks of its principal action. Be prepared for spoilers, but also be prepared to follow the story a lot more easily. It is also really useful to read over the chapter headings that Shepard provides in the table of contents. They are not Jane Austen's own, but they are the editor's descriptions. Chapter titles like The First Ball at Bath for Chapter 2 or The Second Dance with Henry Tilney in Chapter 10 uh, will just help you to remember what the principal action is of those chapters. This episode is really only about Volume 1, uh, the volume that largely takes place in the city of Bath. Bath is a city in the south-central county of Somerset in England. The maps, by the way, on pages 536 to the end of the book are very helpful. Bath is on the site of former Roman baths, and later on its theatres, shops, promenades and walks, social life and its scenic surroundings made it the second most important social centre in 18th century society after London. It had ample opportunities for intrigue, for romance and refinement. On page 142, we have the description of it as a world of busy idleness among the upper classes. And you really do notice how precious few characters in this novel ever, ever have to do a day's labor. The second volume of Northanger Abbey largely unfolds at Northanger Abbey, the Gloucestershire estate of the Tilney family, which consists of General Tilney and his three children. The maps at the back of the book, which I mentioned, are quite helpful. They are more or less uh, set out in order of large to smaller scales. They allow you to see, for instance, where Bath is relative to London. They allow you to see what some of the main surroundings are of Bath toward the Bristol Channel, toward Blaise Castle, for example. And then within Central Bath itself, for those who want to follow uh, the street-by-street -street progressions of and movements of different characters. But the other map that will be very helpful to you, frankly, is one that you need to draw yourself. It's called a character map, and it's a, effectively just a, a listing of the major characters and their relationships to each other. You can come up with a number of different ways of doing this. I usually favor something like a family tree so that I can keep track of whose sibling is whose. But then you draw arrows between different people uh, in order to suggest love interests or villainy or antipathy or friendship or any manner of relationship. You can come up with the most elaborate arrangement that you want. The key divisions or the key families here really are the Morelands, the Thorpes and the Tilneys. You can also add the Allens 
if you like. However, you do your character map, make sure that you put Catherine Moreland right at the center, because this is her story. As Shapard says in his introduction, there isn't a single scene in which Catherine is not present. And it is Catherine's navigation of the social difficulties, of her heart's demands and dictates, of other people's dictates and demands on her time, etc., that is really the backbone of this story. I should say that, all of that I just said, but also, additionally, her reading, her imagination, her sensibility. Look to at uh, the opening of chapter two has a lovely description of her at the age of 17, which she is throughout the novel, when she is coming to Bath. This is page 26. Her heart was affectionate, her disposition cheerful and open, without conceit or affectation of any kind, her manners just removed from the awkwardness and shyness of a girl, her person pleasing, and when in good looks, pretty, and her mind about as ignorant and uninformed as the female mind at 17 usually is. You can judge for yourself whether or not that last sentence is a fair one, based on your own experience, but also based on what you then see Catherine doing throughout this novel. A lot of what Catherine does in Volume 1 consists of social events, obligations, invitations, and many of those happen at balls, which are elaborate dances in the assembly rooms of Bath, of which there are the upper and the lower rooms. The map on 540 will show you where they are. Balls were opportunities for socializing, uh, but also for dancing, obviously, and for dressing, both according to elaborate rules of conduct and of fashion. At the second of these balls in chapter three, Catherine meets Henry Tilney, who becomes her perennial love interest and ultimately her husband. If you look to page 48, you can see what her first impressions are. He seemed to be about four or five and 20, meaning 25, was rather tall, had a pleasing countenance, a very intelligent and lively eye, and if not quite handsome, was very near it. His address, which means his bearing and demeanor, was good, and Catherine felt herself in high luck. And a bit further on, he talked with fluency and spirit, and there was an archness and pleasantry in his manner. That archness is going to be on ample display all the way through this uh, novel, because uh, John Henry likes to poke fun at people that he speaks to in a, in a playful and gentle way. Henry and his sister Eleanor become Catherine's primary social interests, both because of her romantic inclination toward the brother and her admiration of the sister. Look at chapter 8, this is page 116, when we have a description of Miss Tilney. Miss Tilney, this is Eleanor, had a good figure, a pretty face, and a very agreeable countenance. And her air, which again means her outward character or demeanor, though it had not all the decided pretension, the resolute stylishness of Miss Thorpe's, that is, Isabella, Catherine's other friend, had more real elegance. Her manners showed good sense and good breeding, they were neither shy nor affectedly open, that is, unreserved. And she seemed capable of being young, attractive, and at a ball without wanting to fix the attention of every man near her, and without exaggerated feelings of ecstatic delight or inconceivable vexation on every little trifling occurrence. You can see in this description more or less that Austen likes to describe women like Eleanor with or rather in contrast to those she is not like, not like Isabella, or slightly more elegant than Isabella, far less flighty or foolish or exaggerated than other women who are at these balls. But before long, Catherine attracts the attention of a man named John Thorpe, who is the villain of this novel, as we'll see. John Thorpe, with his sister Isabella, is the main foil or adversary to the Tilneys, Henry and Eleanor, and of course their father, General 
Tilney, while Isabella, for instance, is a fast friend to Catherine. She ultimately proves unreliable. She's also quite superficial. She's rather empty-headed. She's jealous, for instance, of Catherine's time and attention. She's, she can be petulant and manipulative. For instance, on page 202, this is chapter 13, Isabella switches between, in a single paragraph, she switches her tactics to try to win over Catherine uh, to spend time with her and not with the Tilneys. She is first affectionate and endearing, uh, but then, tr as, the, as, as, it, as we're told, she tries another method. She's reproachful, she's jealous, and says, these Tilneys seem to swallow up everything else. She also is prone to kind of vacuous language. She has habits of using words like amazing to describe all manner of things. But she's not beyond redemption, Isabella. She apologizes, for instance, in chapter 15, and she reconciles herself to, to Catherine, particularly because of her engagement to Catherine's brother, James. Isabella's brother, John, on the other hand, is boorish and dull and endlessly talking about boring topics like horses and carriages and drinking. In our first encounter with him, page 92, he's described as, quote, a stout young man of middling height who, with a plain face and ungraceful form. A few pages later, James, who knows him because they are fellow undergraduates at Oxford University, describes him on 104 as a bit of a rattle, which is defined as, quote, a person who talks incessantly in a lively or thoughtless manner. Emphasis, I think, on the thoughtless. Uh, later on in chapter 9, uh, we get an elaboration of what a rattle does, and it's kind of threatening. We discover that a rattle is someone who makes, uh, this is page 138, makes idle assertions and impudent falsehoods, uh, and also has a habit of telling lies to increase their importance, or asserting at one moment what they would contradict the next. That all sounds not only insincere, but also threatening. In fact, that is what John Thorpe will end up doing later on. In, in volume two. Also in chapter nine, during a very tedious carriage journey, John describes or talks rather to Catherine of things like horses. This is on 140. Horses and racing and shooting and fox hunting and riding in general. And Catherine really begins to state to the reader anyway, her mild uh, disapproval. Look at the next paragraph. Little as Catherine was in the habit of judging for herself, and unfixed as were her general notions of what men ought to be, she could not entirely repress a doubt while she bore, with the effusions of his endless conceit, of his being altogether completely agreeable. She's doubting that, in other words. This is <laughs> amusingly in the next sentence referred to, or described rather, as a bold surmise not really that bold. She is uh, suffering, quote, the extreme weariness of his company, it, which a few lines later induces her to, quote, distrust his powers of giving universal pleasure. The trouble with all of this, by the way, is that John Thorpe fancies Catherine Moreland, and she, uh, meanwhile, has eyes only for Henry Tilney, look at her agitation that she suffers in chapter 10, page 154. Every young lady may feel for my heroine in this critical moment, for every young lady has at some time or other known the same agitation. All have been, or at least all have believed themselves to be, in danger from the pursuit of someone whom they wish to avoid namely John Thorpe, and all have been anxious for the attentions of someone whom they wish to please, namely Henry Tilney. That fear is exactly what obtains at the ball, the cotillion ball that they are attending. Look what happens on the following page, 156. First, Henry asks her to dance, and, quote, with what sparkling eyes and ready motion she granted his request, and with how pleasing a flutter of heart she went with him to the set, 
may be easily imagined. Rather a roundabout way of saying that she felt all of these things. But right away, John Thor boorishly interjects, calling Henry's request for Catherine's hand in the, in the dance a cursed shabby trick. Thorpe feels that he is the only one entitled to ask Catherine to dance. And Tilney quickly responds to this, at least to Catherine, saying on 160 that he and Catherine, quote, have entered into a contract of mutual, agree- mutual agreeableness for the space of an evening, and all our agreeableness belongs solely to each other for that time. And a bit later, I consider a country dance as an emblem of marriage. Fidelity and complacence, that is, agreeableness, are the principal duties of both, and those men who do not choose to dance or marry themselves have no business with the partners or wives of their neighbors. I am probably reading Tilney's delivery a bit more seriously, uh, more angrily than he intends it. It is a little bit more playful, and he elaborates on it uh, at some length on 162. You will allow, he says, in both, that is marriage and in dancing, man has the advantage of choice, woman only the power of refusal. That in both it is an engagement between man and woman, formed for the advantage of each, and that when once entered into, they belong exclusively to each other till the moment of its dissolution. Thirdly, that it is their duty each to endeavor to give the other no cause for wishing that he or she had bestowed themselves elsewhere, and their best interest to keep their own imaginations from wandering towards the perfections of their neighbors, or fancying that they should have been better off with anyone else. All of the uh, playfulness of his tone and the sociability of the event and the overall feeling of uh, this being something inconsequential, something merely decorative or beautiful or enjoyable purely for its own sake, all of that feeling is kind of made a lot more serious than by this, this metaphor, rather this simile that, um, that Tilney sets up between marriage and dancing. That is to say, all of this activity is kind of a prelude toward marriage. It is a um, precondition. It's, the, it's something quite similar uh, to the more, much more serious undertaking of marriage. It is, in any event, at least a reminder that there are very much larger consequences to uh, the events of these social occasions. The next day, uh, John Thorpe sabotages Catherine's plans for an outing with the Tilneys by lying that he has seen Henry Tilney with another woman riding off in his carriage. And that is not the only time that Thorpe is going to lie to get what he wants. Thus far, I've spent a great deal of time talking about the events within the novel of Northanger Abbey, but I have not really talked about how the novel itself is about its own status as a novel. And part of the reason for that uh, self-awareness of its own narrativity is because Catherine is such an avid reader. At the conclusion of chapter 5, which contains an extended defense of novel reading as a practice, Austin writes on page 76 that and she describes novels as a work in which the greatest powers of the mind are displayed, in which the most thorough knowledge of human nature, the happiest delineation of its varieties, the liveliest effusions of wit and humor are conveyed to the world, in the best chosen language. And in that context, you can really see why John Thorpe is such a boorish character, saying things like he does in chapter 7, page 100 to 102, quote, "'Novels are all so full of nonsense and stuff,' he says. "'There has not been a tolerably decent one come out since Tom Jones, except the monk. I read that the other day. But as for all the others, they are the stupidest things in creation. Do make sure you read the notes on Tom Jones and on the monk in Shepherd's edition on page 101. 
It has to be said that some of this dispraise, some of this disregard for the novel is partly because of the conventions, or rather the gendered conventions of readers. Look at uh, chapter 14, in which um, Catherine says to Henry Tilney, quote, you never read novels, I dare say. This is page 218 because, she goes on, they are not clever enough for you. Gentlemen read better books. And his response is, the person, be it gentleman or lady, who has not pleasure in a good novel must be intolerably stupid. By the way, despite the negativity of that sentiment, that wins the prize for my favorite line in all of Northanger Abbey. I said this was a gendered convention, both because uh, Catherine says gentlemen read better books and also because the note, note 10 on 219, informs us as much. There was a female preference for fiction and a male preference for non-fiction, which frankly obtains to this day. But Tilney, being a superior man, defies this. Look at page 220 in which he says, I myself have read hundreds and hundreds. I think it has to be said, though, that Tilney can be a little bit, hmm, what's the word? Unpleasant, um, uncongenial at times when he finds fault, particularly in others. He, he's a bit categorical, <laughs> a bit. He's very categorical. He describes, for example, even when it comes to gender, uh, on page 52 in chapter 3, he describes the, quote, usual style of letter writing among women, as faultless except in three particulars, and when asked for what they are, he says they are, they, the, the faults include a general deficiency of subject, a total inattention to stops, that is punctuation, and a very frequent ignorance of grammar. That is an instance of mansplaining, if ever there was one. Tilney has gone to Oxford University and has been vastly better educated than any woman of his day was permitted to be educated and goes to some lengths to remind others and including women with whom he's conversing of that fact. He can, in my opinion, be a bit pedantic and over precise. For example, when Catherine commits the capital crime, in his view, of using the word nice in chapter 14, describing Udolpho as the nicest book in the world, he jumps on that language for its, that word nice for its imprecision. Look at 224, how mocking he is. This is a nice day. We're having a nice walk. You're a nice ladies. What a nice word. It does for everything. Uh, and finally, Eleanor loses her patience. Uh, and again, the tone is not very heavy. It's quite light in this moment. But she loses her patience and says, let us leave him to meditate over all f our faults in the utmost propriety of diction, namely of word choice. That mention, by the way, of the novel the, uh, called Udolpho, The Mysteries of Udolpho, brings us to the final subject in this episode, and that is the way that Northanger Abbey is related to other novels. I called initially this an 1818 novel, but that is merely the year that it was published uh, posthumously, i.e. after the death of the author. Jane Austen died in 1817. She finished writing Northanger Abbey, her first complete novel, two decades earlier in 1799. She then revised it in 1803. Why do all of those dates matter, you wonder? Because Northanger Abbey makes multiple references to books that were published in the late 18th century, which is 20 years before its publication, again in 1818. Books, for example, like Anne Radcliffe's 1794 gothic novel, The Mysteries of Udolpho. This is a novel that is going to come up again in Volume 2. 
so I won't say enough en enough at the moment uh, about its specifics. I will only say that its, its genre of the Gothic novel was an extraordinarily popular genre for about 30 years in the late 18th century, that is, about the 1760s to the 1790s. And this is a genre in which heroines suffer mental terror and supernatural threats like, say, ghouls or vampires who lurk in antique settings, including buildings built in the Gothic style like abbeys, churchyards, or crypts. The most lurid of examples is Matthew Lewis's novel from 1796 called The Monk, which John Thorpe alluded to earlier. It includes incest and murder. The genre, though, was steeped in German influences and settings and uh, was quite influenced by translations from German, which reflected a prevailing Germanic influence on English literature in the late 18th and early 19th centuries. And although Udolpho by Anne Radcliffe gets a great deal of attention in Volume 1, it's not until Volume 2 at Northanger Abbey itself that Catherine lets the Gothic novel's various conventions dominate and inform her imagination. But here in Volume 1, we do get Catherine's fantasies of what Blaise Castle will look like, very much informed by her readings of these novels. Look at page 182. This is chapter 11, in which there is a, uh, an outing toward Blaise Castle, which ultimately needs to get called off. But the anticipation of it is enough for Catherine to get excited about. It consoles her, in a way, because she's been separated from the Tilneys. She says on 182, The happiness which its walls... This is Blaise Castle... The happiness which its walls could supply, the happiness of a progress through a long suite of lofty rooms exhibiting the remains of magnificent furniture, though now for many years deserted, the happiness of being stopped in their way along narrow winding vaults by a low grated door, or even of having their lamp, their only lamp, extinguished by a sudden gust of wind, and of being left in total darkness." Odd, perhaps, that you would describe such events as happy. The happiness all comes from that thrill of recognition, the thrill of anticipation that something like the novel will happen in life itself. But there's another very important genre that I haven't mentioned yet. Along with the Gothic novel, Northanger Abbey is a response to what's called the sentimental novel which is a genre about young women who suffer misadventures in love and romance, including trials of their virtue. They engage in elaborate social events, and have, which involve com very complex social expectations. There are suitors who compete for their attention and their affection. There are misunderstandings and there are miscommunications, all of which the heroine of the sentimental novel navigates in order to arrive at a happy ending. Heroines need an inner moral compass as well as a grasp of external social rules and customs. And we learn the titles of some of these novels. For example, uh, on page 11, note 17, we learn about Charlotte Smith's Emmeline from 1788, Jane Austen also makes various witty asides about such novels. For example, right at the close of chapter, tw chapter 11, uh, page 186, she refers to her heroine sleeping on a sleepless couch, uh, a pillow strewed with thorns and wet with tears, etc. And these are all conventions of a sentimental novel. Much, much earlier in chapter 2, this is on page 42, we get a parody of some of those conventions at uh, one of the balls that uh, the Catherine is attending. Now was the time for a heroine who had not yet played a very distinguished part in the events of the evening to be noticed and admired. And a bit further on, we can see how life does not quite match the descriptions of these novels. Uh, Catherine, quote, was now seen by many young men who had not been near her before. Not one, however, started with rapturous wonder on beholding her. 
No whisper of eager inquiry ran round the room, nor was she once called a divinity by anybody. Where does all of this come from? Well, way back in chapter 1, we have learned right at the bottom of page 14, we have learned that Catherine, from 15 to 17, was in training for a heroine. She read all such works as heroines must read, for example, to get various imagines, uh, imaginative uh, self-constructions, as we have seen later on. And so volume one of Northanger Abbey has shown us the uncertain pathway of love for Catherine, the unwritten rules, the chance meetings, the clever conversations, the injured feelings, and the fervid anxieties that attend love. The stage is set, then, for a dramatic escalation of these tensions, hopes, and jealousies, when, in volume two, our scene shifts to Northanger Abbey itself. You've been listening to Open Book, a podcast about interpreting literature with Michael Elliott. The next episode is on books five and six of John Milton's epic Paradise Lost, covering the war in heaven and other key elements of Satan's origin story. Meanwhile, you can search me up in the usual places. It should turn up my blog if you spell my surname U-L-L-Y-O-T, or go straight there by typing j.mp slash Elliot. You can also find me on Instagram, YouTube, and Twitter in descending order of regularity, and then there's old-fashioned email, Elliot at ucalgary, that's U-C-A-L-G-A-R-Y dot C-A. The music from this episode is courtesy of the Open Well-Tempered Clavier Project and performed by Kimiko Ishizaka. Mm-hmm.